All right, we're back in here to live and out from Fox 90 Gloomy overcast day, and they're dealing with eight. How so their encounters? They mail, paychecks, life saving medications, e commerce purchases, and ballot. Potentially. Back out here before we get out to our Fox 11 team in their coverage because some of this video is very dramatic and we don't know a ton of information right now about this here on live and now from Fox. Of course, breaking news of this, uh, as you can see, potentially law enforcement officials and other officials just outside of a gate, this on a street uh, near the Beverly Hills area. Of course, we're following it very closely on live now from Fox. And of course, we're watching this. We didn't know exactly what we were seeing at the time. So this is just a little bit ago. As they, you can see a crowbar to get through this gate initially as well. The long guns and a multitude of people. As you'll see, they'll zoom out a little bit just to see the amount of force they are using to get inside this home. And of course, the complex in which this home sits is a very expansive one for the American rapper and producer. You can see them checking inside of a vehicle. We don't know exactly what is involved, if Diddy's even there. We don't know a ton of information about this at all, but this was dramatic video coming in of the Los Angeles home there, raided by Homeland Security. Some of those images there on the backs of them. We also saw uh, other images. I want to uh, kind of quickly move to what else we saw as people were led away, potentially in custody. Don't know who these individuals are, if they're related to Diddy in any way, but you can see them, a dramatic video from our Sky Fox team there in Los Angeles as we continue to cover this. And our Fox 11 team is there on the ground right now as we speak. Let's take you out to some of their coverage yeah. here this developing story out of Los Angeles. So, uh, and then detain those three people inside. We haven't seen any signs of P. Diddy himself. I didn't find the jersey. Uh, but several yeah. people inside the home that uh, will surely this be questioned. Uh, very chaotic scene well. when all of this happened. Uh, lots of, um, of neighbors wondering what's going on, of course. And uh, we'll keep you updated. But it's definitely going to be quite a scene here. For the it was a Larry Bird jersey. Yeah, when you see yeah, this number of law enforcement agencies coming together, what? making what? this type of raid to such a big, high-profile mansion like this, in a neighborhood like this as well, this is very thought out, methodical, planned out for days. So. They base this on a number of information gathering that they've received and evidence or what they're looking for. So clearly this is not yep. something they do lightly. They really go th through the process yep. of making sure that everything is right ready before they conduct a raid like, like this. So lot. yes, this took a lot of planning for all these multiple agencies to come together to actually now Probably. conduct a type of raid like this. As you're seeing right now with this street also uh, shut down for the time being. Because Haley, you could see the perimeter has been set up in that neighborhood to keep just the public back from the work that's being done. And there you have the shot from Sky Fox. Again, these heavily armed vehicles right next to all those luxury cars. You already see a Porsche, a G-Wagon, so many luxury cars right there on that property. So it is a very differing uh, juxtaposition there of, of what you're seeing. But look at this mansion here in Holmby Hills where the raid is taking place. Again, we don't know what exactly they're looking for, who they're looking for. But again, this could possibly be linked to a sex trafficking investigation involving rapper Sean Combs, the music executive. But as you heard from Haley right there, she believes and she's been hearing that we do not think that Sean Combs is on that property at home right now. He may be in New York as this raid is being conducted. But we do know from our reporting that over the course of the year already, just as early as uh, March this year, there have been several lawsuits filed against Sean Combs. So clearly this could be part of it. We are not sure at this point. But again, Stu, if you could hear me, what are you seeing right now in terms of uh, your point of view? Well, again, we saw some of those uh, officers right there at that one of the back houses. They did bring a ladder in. They, were, they, they actually went out and brought that ladder into that property. You see it right there. And then they brought another ladder. So there's probably something inside this building right here that they are very curious about, or they were, like you said, it was very well planned. They knew they were going to need that ladder to make access. So the, there's something inside this pr piece of property in the back as one of the back houses that they have been very interested in getting at. We haven't seen them bring anything out. At one point there's there, I, I can say, and when I keep saying that we didn't see them bring anything out, the, the, we did see them bring out what looked like a big uh, plastic bin, but I don't know if that was something that they had brought in. As far um, as possible tools that they needed, right but that was the only thing that was seemed to be out of the ordinary. Right and that here, did come right? from that back house. That yeah, I watched all them. Uh, I watched everything today. Although I, I feel like a bunch of that stuff was clean, but just it's sitting on hangers and dust. And I just wanted to fr give it a fresh. And then uh, we watched as officers were getting through one of the pedestrian gates. They over here on this side of the property. Once they had breached that, well, I'm in the Coke Seven. That shit is double extra large. Try that on. Nah, that shit different. That won't fit there.
Let's see, that one's a little, it got a little more thing. That's where we watched them exit the building with the officers early on when this raid was just starting. As it stands right now, you've got plenty of these armored, uh, uh, law enforcement still walking the property. You see, uh, see them walking in pairs. A lot less of those weapons out, so they are shot. less on the uh, defensive as it would be. And then you yeah, see them kind of making their way through that property. But Yo, how come they're they, catching them? They and them Higgins crazy, bro. Major homes. This one right here, there's a couple of officers still inside there. We know at least one officer is still inside here. So they're still standing guard. So that whatever it is that they're doing, this isn't over by any means. And I think this is probably just getting underway. They just want to make sure that all these buildings are secure. That's his house, all of us? Yeah, no, just that right there, dude. Yeah. That's, that's the guest house. That's the guest house and use the main house. The fuck when you own a record label that uh, the of people are assigned to. You can see them right there. This is just a small group. That was also one of the things. As soon as they made their way into that pedestrian gate, the first thing they did was open up all those doors on that Range Rover and then made their way into this portion of the home. And that's that garage that we've been talking about. That garage door went up very quickly and if, um, all the people that we've seen come out of the building that's where they all came from and yeah, they got out, got in this little corner right here huh? and that's where they've been questioning them ever since Another ladder you mentioned, there's a couple of ladders on site as part of this raid. I don't know what they're looking for. I didn't see that right. They're trying to reach, but you did see somebody carry the ladder. The second one on the property right now, it does seem like there are three different buildings on this property, the main mansion, and then two guest houses, for lack of better knowledge, in terms of what they are exactly used for. But yes, two smaller type houses on the That's his house in Cali. And of course, the pool right there. He has a house in Miami. He has one in New York. Yeah, this is going to take time, and that is why probably there's so many personnel on site to go through everything and do the search that they are conducting. If you had to raise this house, are you taking the memorabilia? All of the information in terms trying of what evidence anything? they're trying to collect. Yeah. You're looking you just online. shove it in your pocket and no one noticed. You're taking this for evidence. Like this could possibly be yeah, just uh, involving off the the sex trafficking eBay. investigation. And uh, again, Make when we get more details, back. of course, we'll bring it to you. But uh, <laughs> this is going to be a while. You see the Department of Homeland Security officers right there. Yeah, but why do they need guns? You know, this could be phase two of what to do. You never know. Did he just say, fuck it, we're going out. Like making sure they have all their information. Like a devil's reject. Right? When they conduct a raid like That's this, a and go through the process the of going through that property. It is a big mansion, indeed, owned by Bad Boy Films and one of Sean Combs' children. So, again, uh, this happening just about... 20 minutes ago at this point, we do have video from earlier, if we could show you that, and we have been showing some of that to you in a bigger box, um, as a, a juxtaposed to the live pictures you're seeing right now, but uh, when they made entry, it was very methodical, and they did have many different law enforcement officials here as a unified operation, and uh, a lot of them making sure that those entry points are secure, Dang, and they're able to make entry all together with uh, very, very little use of force. So um, clearly it is, a, it is a process whenever you conduct a raid like this. So again, we do have Haley Winslow on the ground as well. She is pushed back to a certain perimeter though, so they're very differing vantage points that we can see. But if we do look at the ground shot there, you see law enforcement on the ground there as well. Haley, uh, anything changing where you are, you're at right now? So Barry, I guess, did Just drive to be showing up on the scene. It's been pretty hectic out here. It's only folded about 25 Run. minutes. Whoa. What a boy ready. He ready. Clumsy. Look, Clumsy. Wrote the where Clumsy at? He said he was waiting there, and he's going back. Clumsy, Barry, where you at, Clumsy? Barry, Barry never showed up. I apologize. He couldn't hear but you. But that Barry, Barry said he was there. very loud, especially. He's got, of course, What's going, going on, bro? Who's, who's? All of this from overhead. Why are they but meeting up? Who's fronting right now? Clumsy said that he was. Uh, Clumsy's fronting. Clumsy front? Ago, oh, no. 30 or so law enforcement vehicles that were from the Department of Homeland Security, LASD, of course, LAPD assisting in this as well. And they pulled up to this home uh, that's registered to Bad Boy Films, part of Bad Boy Entertainment, one of uh, Pete Diddy's companies. And so is Diddy uh, and Jill also registered to one of his daughters. So they basically all got Ooh. out of the three Diddy bear cats. They went in. They were obviously. Oh, is that Diddy right there? A few people out as Damn. She was telling you up in Sky Fox. Um, but we're hearing that Pete Diddy may not even be here. We no, of course haven't seen him. Uh, we understand Diddy. he may have flown on a private jet to New York, which I'm sure kind of threw off their plan, although this was very strategically organized. So they I assume by now, uh, whether he is in New York or not, that he is uh, likely in custody if he is involved in this. Uh, but again, we are hearing that this is involving P. Diddy and sex trafficking charges. To what extent or with what details, we don't yet know. But of course, Damn, they, they got Diddy fucked day. up yeah, right now. No. Oh, shit. Well, you don't know until you get convicted. By then, and, uh, if you do commit suicide, it's in jail. I think that Epstein had enough money to get out of there.
think it was a lie. Yeah, I think I, I think with I think with the right he bribe, the prison he stayed at, he paid them so much money to be like, hey, just say that I'm dead. But where the money at though? Wouldn't that have been noticed that that? Had to kill somebody, make it look like that's his body. Have them move a body out on like a stretcher for proof. No, because that's that's all private. So if you die in a jail and no family records like condemns you. Okay, we are hearing from TMZ at this point that P. Diddy, Sean Combs, home in Miami is being raided as well. What? Like, what? Look up the Miami home right home in Miami is reportedly being raided right now as well. So clearly a link in all of this, but yeah. as uh, far as yeah. more information yeah. in terms of what they're looking yeah. for, why this raid is being conducted, for? Let's go to still Miami. Let's go get more, a lot of questions thing. and answers at this point. We're looking for answers uh, and more clarity, yeah. so we're hoping yeah. to get more of that as this uh, raid continues, but they will be there for some time. Look, that's still, Miami right there, too. movement you're seeing from up there in Skybox? Nope, just the uh, just the, these uh, the guys on the ground down there, the, the heavily armed uh, officers that made their way inside. They actually are kind of just milling about or holding the perimeter as it would be. The non-essential, you can see them making their way back over to these armored vehicles, probably doing a little debrief about what they saw. In, in any type of these situations, Man. it really is, you know, you've got these armored officers that go in first, but I would venture to say the investigators or the people that are know what they're looking for, probably still out there on the streets, and they're waiting for that all clear to make sure that there is absolutely nobody on this property. And again, this is just a, a precaution. They don't want to have any kind of issues. Maybe somebody's hiding Come still, up. maybe just scared. And then, you know, it doesn't have to be nefarious uh, it, just because oh, they no. don't know what's going on and they just don't want to have somebody pop out of a, a closet or a bathroom or any, any one of these rooms while they're doing that investigation and then other problems can ensue. So that's basically why we're seeing that large presence. They keep walking through there. And like you mentioned, this is an extremely large home and probably with many rooms and little secret areas. So they want to make sure that everything is cleared before they allow those investigators in to start doing that investigation, whatever it is that they're looking for. But you can see a number of those officers making their way back into that major this is the big main house, as it would be, making their way back inside. And I would venture to say that they're going to just go through every one of those rooms and make sure that there is nobody in there. I don't think they're those those guys that we're seeing, guys and gals that we're seeing in those heavily armored uh, gear and equipment. I don't think they're actually searching for any items that could connect so to, uh, to whatever sure the investigation is. I would venture to say that those are going to be the guys that you're seeing right there, and they're waiting for that all clear. And then this group that you see there, those are the ones that are actually yeah. going to go inside. They probably have, like you said, they probably have ideas where what they're looking for, where they might be. So, But right now, it is still a, wait, a waiting game to make sure that everybody is out of this building and that it is secure for the uh, for the investigators to make their way in and actually start that search. And we should mention, thank you, you Stu, that, that uh, if this is in fact involving involved a sex trafficking investigation. We do know that according to yeah. these attorneys and the uh, rapper himself, he has denied any wrongdoing in any of all this. So uh, there are two sides, of course, to this as this all plays out. But it is interesting that these raids happening at the same time, according to TMZ. A raid of his Miami home is happening right now, as well as now we're looking at the live pictures of what's going on in Holmby Hills at this mansion right here, all connected to Sean Combs. So again, until we find out further word as to what exactly they're searching for and why. Uh, we continue to look at the procedures taking place regarding this raid that's being conducted by Homeland Security. You have support from local law enforcement officials as well. Man, we saw from the ground here, shots, you see multiple the agencies time. there. Sometimes it even hurts. This, and uh, so they cold. have a number of resources so on cold. hand. With a drone <laughs> flying up top as well yeah, as they have ladders taking uh, Yo, it's cold as bricks. The me, uh, and so they are looking at every nook and cranny they need to in terms of why they're investigating uh, this home and property. So clearly this is going to take a while. And as Haley mentioned, with her shot down on the ground right there, more people are coming to your area. Haley? Yeah, I would say it's mostly media at this point. We were uh, the first ones here on scene, but yeah, since there's probably a dozen different uh, media agencies. But yeah, it looks like his uh, his homes on both coasts are being raided. We still have not gotten word on exactly where P. Diddy is, if he is in fact in New York right now, or in Los Angeles, and uh, of course, you know, we've, we haven't seen him here in Holmby Hills. This is right off of Sunset and Beverly Glen, and it all unfolded, I'd say, about 30 minutes ago. Uh, they're at his home here. They're also at his home in Miami. Of course, uh, it's, a, it's a little bit calmer, I would say, than it was about 20 minutes ago when it all happened. Uh, the, the guns that were drawn earlier have been since put away. They, it looks like they just put away their drone, but of course doing a thorough job of checking the home for any kind of details that they can come up with related to this, uh, these allegations against sex trafficking. As you said, Sandra, there's several lawsuits against him for uh, these Yo, allegations. Yo, where the chat at, dog? Uh, 
Uh, so we will have to wait and see. Of course, uh, and everybody's interested in the details of, of what, um, uh, how he's connected um, to, to these latest allegations. And from your so vantage point, the very latest system, I'm sorry? Yeah, from your vantage point, Haley, does it look like some authorities are leaving the, the scene right now? They're, they're done? Or not, is that not the case? No, it looks like more are coming. Um, I think what you're seeing is just the vehicles moving to a different location. We're kind of at the bottom of the hill, but if you go up a little bit farther, some of the vehicles that you saw down here earlier have since uh, kind of gone to the other side of the hill. This is obviously a very prestigious neighborhood. Uh, I said earlier, Humphrey Bogart's former house, I think is next door to P. Diddy's, uh, in the 200 block here of Mapleton and Holmby Hills off of Sunset near uh, Beverly Glen. Um, so the vehicles have basically just moved forward. You're seeing a lot more of those uh, law enforcement officers from the Department of Homeland Security, though, back here on the street in Mapleton since uh, they've come out of the home after they've done their thorough investigating inside um, that beautiful home belonging to P. Diddy, to Sean Combs. So I don't think they have any intention, Sandra, on going anywhere anytime soon. And overhead, you can see uh, law enforcement, helicopters, and of course, Stu up there in Sky Fox. Thank you so much, Haley, for that perspective on the ground right there in front of that Holmby Hills mansion. Stu up in Sky Fox, it looks like, yes, there are some more law enforcement, but in different attire. I shall, should I say suits in, instead of body armor? Definitely, and, and, and you know, and we all know how that works. The suits are going to be the investigators and probably the, uh, the the ones that are running the show. And again, I still think that they are just waiting for that uh, green light for them to be allowed to make their way inside the property and to make their way to the areas that I would venture to say that they probably are pretty specific. I don't think they're just going in randomly. And again, this is just a, a guess. They, you know, I don't think they're going in randomly, just going through you know everybody's stuff inside there. They probably have an area that they know or an office that they're going to be looking into or some computers that they might want to physically get their hands on. And that's what they're waiting for right now to make their way inside this. Yo, you think like you said, very you think Diddy knows the Holmley Hills area and they just right waiting to yeah, get the all clear to allow them inside while these uh, while these and officers that we see right there in the tactical so gear, well, their job is to make sure that everything is safe for them to go in. Now, they don't probably, in, 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 again, <laughs> it's radio, they're always thinking that there's, there's, there's booby traps or some kind of sniper inside the home. That's not what they're thinking at all. It's probably more along the line that they want to make sure that everybody is outside of the home because they don't want to have somebody stepping out or coming out later on and you know surprising or getting people off guard that's not what they want and right now you can see like like the like uh, Sandra would have been saying there's a large number of people out here I would venture to say as far as the officers go I would probably put this group closer to a hundred not just what we're seeing right here this is just one group of many that have made their way out here to this Holmby Hills area and as far as the suits that we were talking about that's part of the group right there but there's some other ones as well younger ones that were leading basically leading the charge and they, they that's them right there actually they, they perfect timing and it looks like they're making their way over towards the home they might be the first ones to make their way in to, to start that investigation process or f figure out where we're going to look what we're looking for and then later on the uh, suits will make their way in as well but this like you said is going to be a very long process out here and this is just the very very beginning and the folks that they had taken into custody they've moved them out of the area right now and again, would say that they are arrested. We don't know that for a fact. They took them into custody. A few of them still had cuffs on. Some of them didn't. So what maybe this was a division of, you What's know, the these are people that we know work yeah. here. These are people that may be associated uh, with Sean Combs so, or Bad Boy Entertainment. So it, it, it's one of those type of situations. And until they know who they are, they're just going to keep them in custody and possibly just let them go later on. And I don't believe the word arrested has been used out here as of yet. But again, still very active situation. And of course, that is a huge house and they've got a lot of rooms to clear before they allow those investigators in. Yeah, we talk about Yo, the you gonna flip of these or what? many law enforcement officials to the these scene right to here, have look. a raid like this and conduct a raid and make entry into uh, a Holmby a Hills of... mansion that's owned What's by that, a prominent they're celebrity a bag right in there. and their business. They made so them clearly, fur, you this got... is something that doesn't what happen just overnight. Law enforcement officials do have to have No, uh, somebody else, uh, that's somebody else. Sure I think that, you know who Skelly is? I heard of That's Skelly is sick. So when we talk about and see these kinds of raids happen or having them be conducted, it kind of shows that they do have enough evidence. <laughs> And uh, the, the guns that were drawn earlier have been since put away. They, it looks like they just put away their drone, but of course doing a thorough job of checking the home for any kind of details that they can come up with related to this, uh, these allegations against sex trafficking. As you said, Sandra, there's several about lawsuits New York, against him for uh, these New allegations, York? all of which what? he has denied. Uh, so we will have to wait and see. Of course, uh, and everybody's interested in the details of, of what, um, how he's connected um, to, to these latest allegations. And from your so vantage point, the very latest I'm sorry? Yeah, from your vantage point, Haley, does it look like some authorities are leaving the, the scene right now? They're, they're done? Or not, is that not the case? 
No, it looks like more are coming. Um, I think what you're seeing is just the vehicles moving to a different location. We're kind of at the bottom of the hill, but if you go up a little bit farther, some of the vehicles that you saw down here earlier have since uh, kind of gone to the other side of the hill. This is obviously a very prestigious neighborhood. Uh, I said earlier, Humphrey Bogart's former house, I think, is next door to P. Diddy's, uh, in the 200 block here of Mapleton and Holmby Hills off of Sunset near uh, Beverly Glen. Um, so the vehicles have basically just moved forward. You're seeing a lot That's more of those right. uh, law enforcement officers from the Department of Homeland Security, though, back here on the street in Mapleton since uh, they've come out of the home after they've done their thorough investigating inside um, that beautiful home belonging to P. Diddy to Sean Combs. So I don't think they have any intention, Sandra, on going anywhere anytime soon. And overhead, you can see uh, law enforcement helicopters and, of course, Sue up there in Sky Fox. Thank you so much, Haley, for that perspective on the ground right there in front of that Holmby Hills mansion. Stu, up in Sky Fox, it looks like, yes, there are some more law enforcement, but in different attire. I shall, should I say suits in, instead of body armor? Definitely, and, and, and you know, and we all know how that works. The suits are going to be the investigators and probably the, uh, the the ones that are running the show. And again, I still think that they are just waiting for that uh, green light for them to be allowed to make their way inside the property and to make their way to the areas. Then I would venture to say that they probably are pretty specific. You don't think they're just going in randomly. And again, this is just a, a guess. You know, I don't think they're going in randomly, just going through you know everybody's stuff inside there. They probably have an area that they know or an office that they're going to be looking into or some computers that they might want to physically get their hands on. And that's what they're waiting for right now to make their way inside this property. This, like you said, very beautiful home out there in the Homely Hills area. And they just waiting to get the all clear to allow them inside. While these uh, while these officers that we see right there in the tactical gear, well, their job is to make sure that everything is safe for them to go in. Now they don't probably. And again, I just want to be clear. It's like nobody's thinking that there's booby traps or some kind of sniper inside the home. That's not what they're thinking at all. It's probably more along the lines of they want to make sure that everybody is outside of the home because they don't want to have somebody stepping out or coming out later on and you know surprising or catching people off guard that's not what they want and right now you can see like like the, like uh Sandra, uh, you would say there's a large number of people out here. I would venture to say, as far as the officers Yo, go, I would probably got, put this group closer to 100. Trump. Not just what we're seeing right here. This is just they one group of many that have made their way out here to this whole area. They lower down his bail to 175 we minutes. Oh, the group right there. No, but there's some other ones as well, younger ones. They lowered his bail. That's his bail. And they, yeah, bail is 175 minutes. Perfect timing. He pays back. He got it lowered. They might be the first ones to make their way in. Come over here. Start that investigation process or but figure out where we're going to look, what we're looking for, and then later on the uh, suits will make their way in as well. But this, is, like you said, is going to be a very long process out here, and this is just the very, very what? beginning. And the folks that they had taken into custody, they've moved them out of the area right now. And again, let's say that they are arrested. We don't know that for a fact. They took them into custody. A few of them still had cuffs on. Some of them didn't. So maybe this was a division of, you know, these are people that we know work here. These are people that may be associated uh, with Sean Combs so, or Bad Boy Entertainment. So it, it, it's one of those type of situations. And until they know who they are, they're just going to keep them in custody and possibly just let them go later on. And I don't believe the word arrested has been used out here as of yet. But again, still very active situation. And of course, that is a huge house and they've got a lot of rooms to clear before they allow those investigators in. Yeah, we talk about the process of bringing this many law enforcement officials to the scene to have a raid like this and conduct a raid and make entry into a Holmby Hills mansion that's owned by a prominent celebrity and their All right. business. What time so is clearly, the thing this is something that doesn't so, happen just overnight. Uh -huh. Law enforcement officials do have to have their evidence ready. They have to make sure every T is crossed in order to well, make entry well, into well, a home well, like this for an investigation. Well, so when we well, talk about and see well, these well, kinds of raids happen or having them be conducted it, it kind of shows that they do have enough evidence that their investigation is to a certain point where they have made a search warrant and they've gotten all of the evidence they need to have a search warrant that they have to establish that a crime was possibly committed and there's evidence of probable cause and a crime that has taken place so all of these things they have to meet a threshold before law enforcement can just come together like this and approach a property and make entry so we're seeing that here at Holmby Hills and also in Miami where they are searching Sean Combs' Miami home as well. So again, this doesn't just happen overnight. This is a process that they've been working on for quite some time to make sure that they have enough evidence to be able to conduct a raid like this, especially with so many law enforcement agencies involved, investigators involved, and you see just personnel involved on location right there. And you do see a number of people. This is going to be an active situation for quite some time. Again, we don't know what they're looking for. We don't know what the interest is right now. We can uh, only presume that it is part of a sex trafficking investigation. Uh, those are um, uh, multiple lawsuits that Sean Combs have been facing this year alone.
allegations that he denies, but clearly this could be all part of the process here. But again, law enforcement does just not go in willy-nilly into a home and conduct a raid like this unless they get the necessary evidence they need to get that search warrant to acquire entry as well. So if we could take a look from Haley's point of view, it does seem like there are more individuals gearing up or maybe more investigators on the scene uh, from the ground there, Haley. Hey Sandra, yes, we're actually trying to get an interview lined up, obviously live with the Department of Homeland Security. We had a lady come down here just a minute ago and give her card, so trying to contact her so we can, of course, get some official details from her because everything that we're getting is basically behind the scenes from our law enforcement uh, sources here. So basically, we don't have anything new yet. We're still just waiting to kind of figure out exactly what happened. We know, of course, P. Diddy's homes on both coasts have been raided. Uh, you can see some more uh, officers coming. Uh, coming out of his property right now just trying to see if I could see the lady who um, we're hoping to get the interview with and she um, she's just messaging me back so I've got to send her an email for the request first so we're working on okay. that to get you some more details but <laughs> Just more and more vehicles showing up. This is largely, most of the law enforcement officers here, Sandra, are, of course, the Department of Homeland Security, and then we also have LASD and LAPD here as well. So All as right, soon as I can get anything official on camera, we'll come back uh, We'll come back and let you know. Definitely. I know what it's like on the ground right there. You're dealing with a lot of officials, trying to get some answers, trying to talk to people, and, of course, it is very difficult to do two things at once, so we will let you uh, get to work right there on the ground. Let's go up to Stu again. As I was mentioning the procedure of this, and you've covered so many of these types of stories. You've been overhead when these raids have happened. This isn't a process that just happens overnight. Clearly, they are looking for something, they have enough evidence, and they were able to get a search warrant before they could even do or conduct a raid like this. Oh, you definitely, as Sandra, what you're talking about really kind of shows exactly what you're trying to point out, that this didn't just happen overnight, this wasn't just a, an accusation and they came and, you know, knocked down the doors and started tearing up the house. This was something that's an ongoing investigation. Lawyers, dep attorneys, and uh, district attorneys, they all have to sign off on this. They have to look this over. Judges have to make that decision as well. And nobody wants to be on the end of a, of a wrongful uh, seizure. So, of course, they needed to show evidence that there is a reason for this type of force and for these officers to make their way into this home. And then again, of course, the, in the world we live in today, all of these officers that are showing up, they all know that, you know, we are under, they're, everybody's under a watchful eye nowadays. So they made every effort to do this as quickly and as uh, less destructive as possible. We watched them uh, try to get through one of those side gates, that pedestrian gate was giving them a little bit of an issue, but in the end they got in there. And after that, they made their way in very quickly. We didn't see any doors being smashed or things getting kicked in. It was basically a lot of opening up and just letting uh, that garage door, somebody got in there and they opened up that garage door and or possibly the people inside were curious what was going on and they opened up that garage door. But again, a lot the forceful entry part of it, it really truly was just in a little bit here in that side gate. Everything else was very quick and, and, uh, and with etiquette would be the best way to say it actually. Yeah. <laughs> they went in and they just did what they needed to do and again, the reason why they're still there I, I can tell you it's it's not like a, it's not like a television show where they're pulling out drawers and dumping out clothes and just trashing the place. They just want to make sure that there are no other people inside that building that may still be scared, hiding, or having a problem. And that as soon as that word is given, which I'm sure is going to come shortly, because we already saw a couple of the, the groups making their way in, less armed. So they're making their way in. They're going to start looking forward. And of course, even in that the warrant, they're going to have a list of things that they are able to look at, able to take. It isn't just a random search. They actually have to go in and actually find things that they believe have information or evidence that could create an, 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 an <coughs> guilty or innocent uh, situation for Sean Combs. So at any rate, it's still very ongoing, very preliminary, but again, we do see a large force out there, which Doug, you're trying to say, or what I believe you did say, is that this is a warranted search. And of course, uh, they are here, and they are definitely looking for specific pieces of information. What they are, we don't know. We may never know, but uh, right now, that search is definitely ongoing. Yeah, you, you said it. I mean, we've covered so many of these different types of raids. Obviously, not always at a celebrity mansion like this in Holmby Hills, uh, but clearly sometimes you see them having to forcefully enter a property and seize evidence, and it doesn't always go so smoothly. And it was, in fact, very smooth the way they gained ent entry into this property. And uh, after they figured out that side entrance, uh, they were able to make entry. But it, it's not like they see they do they show in the movies, as you mentioned, Stu, right? Uh, they weren't battering yeah. down uh, doors and uh, destroying property. Uh, this is very methodical and in terms of many stories we've covered like this it was a very easy entry and they were able to access the property and get on on site so uh, clearly uh, they're ready for anything um, whatever they're going to be met with you, you don't know and that is why they make sure that they 
are safe in numbers, that they're armored, and, and that is why you see such a big force out there. Because you never know what kind of emotion you're going to be met with. Definitely, and, and emotion is really what plays a lot of it, and that's one of the things that we were talking about is, you know, right now, th that was the gate that they were having all that trouble. They're actually looking at that actual door and uh, propping it open, but that was the, the door that was giving them trouble. And we were trying to, I was trying to figure out if that is actually maybe like a private entrance for that back house. It does actually look like it. It seems like, you know, if you're staying there, that's how you get in and out without going through the actual house itself. But you can see they still have uh, personnel there on scene. Every, every house, there's three properties that I would say on this big piece of property, they all have uh, some some sort of uh, somebody there, just making sure that there isn't anything being taken or anything moving in and out and or another person in that area. But that main house, there's still a number of folks uh, that, uh, like armored uh, personnel that we've seen go in and have not seen come out. But there's some of those uh, ones that are not wearing the gear, and those are the that first group that made their way in. They were here originally. They came with the, uh, with the armored trucks. They did not make their way into the property. They waited outside, and now they are actually making their way to that front door, which it shows you that it, their progress is being made. And of course, we would keep keeping an eye on the, uh, as we call them, and it is what they are, the suits down there. I'm sure those are the ones that are pretty much running the show or where all the evidence is going to go to in the end. They are still outside, so that shows you that uh, they're going to be waiting. I would venture to say when they find something, those are the guys that are going to make their way in and actually looking at and uh, taking things from this home. But right now, that's still, that process, I wouldn't even think has actually even started. Yeah, absolutely. And it's going to take a lot of time. That is a huge mansion to begin with. And then it depends on what they're looking for. It could be as small as a hard drive or as big as boxes yeah. and boxes boxes full of evidence or information they're trying to collect and gather. And where all that information is, is also the tricky part. I mean, think about going into a stranger's home. You don't know where they put things. And so it could be very hidden. It, so this whole process, uh, it could take a lot of time in terms of them finding what they made entry for. So this is a methodical, lengthy process. And again, this is taking place right here in Holmby Hills, as well as his Miami home. And I'm sure law enforcement officials from both sides in Miami and LA are certainly talking to each other other as they go through this as well but still no sign of Sean Combs himself we don't know where he is uh, it's not clear if they're looking for him he may be in New York as Haley was mentioning on the ground there but uh, clearly uh, this was in all a very peaceful raid as they made entry and right now as they are making their way in and out of the property as they conduct their search but a search that is just beginning as you see those suits the investigators uh, taking their time making sure everything is done properly and methodically in terms of what they're looking for at this point again we have a lot of questions that we just don't know the answers to at this point. We do have someone on the line right now, Hal Kempfer. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, if you can make light of what we're looking at in terms of Homeland Security making entry into the Holmby Hills mansion of Sean Combs. Uh, Sandra, this is a Homeland Security Investigations that appears to be on site. Uh, what they're probably looking for is, well, I should say in, in general, uh, they look at uh, human trafficking and uh, sex trafficking being a component of that. And of course, there's been a uh, uh, some rather uh, big civil suit stuff that's taken, taken place, but also the New York case uh, where the statute of limitations uh, basically had been rescinded, uh, allowing them to look back many years in this case. Uh, part of it was there's a, there have been uh, allegations that, uh, that he was drugging uh, young women, uh, so that there was, uh, you know, which, which you know, certainly implies that it was rape uh, that had taken place at some, at some point. Uh, but I think what HSI is probably looking at is the interstate aspects of it, if there was any online activity that could have taken place. And, uh, and that's usually where HSI would have a jurisdictional interest. Homeland Security Investigations being part of the Department of Homeland Security, uh, looking at the interstate side, mostly online and whatever took place across state lines. And of course, you know, he travels all over the place. So uh, I'm sure they're looking at him potentially transporting women uh, around the country and, uh, and whether that was tied to a larger criminal activity. Yeah, definitely Homeland Security involved in any interstate, as you mentioned, and international uh, criminal activity here. So what exactly do you think everyone is looking for at this point? We saw such a, a large number of law enforcement make entry. Well, it, it's a combination of both uh, local uh, and federal. And it's, it, from what I understand, the local law enforcement has the specific lead at each one of these locations with the federal, law invest, uh, federal investigators coming in uh, with them in concert. And what they're probably looking for is any evidence that they can gather, uh, certainly any images, pictures, uh, video, anything online. I have no doubt that they're going in and, and gathering up any electronic media to include uh, any laptops, uh, any, any uh, flash drives, anything uh, that, they, that he might have that might support whatever allegations, whatever 
reasonable suspicion that they have uh, that led to this uh, these search warrants. You know, they, just to get a search warrant like this uh, requires a, a, a you know a rather rather uh, uh, you know a certain substantial legal barrier has to be our legal argument or legal uh, uh, litmus test has to be met just to get them to sign off. Particularly knowing with somebody with uh, with means like this that if they go into their home, they're going to be met with some very capable lawyers on the defendant's part to uh, challenge what was ever done and everything they do there is going to be challenged. So you can imagine not only did they have to uh, work with uh, district attorney and potentially assistant U.S. attorneys in arranging this, but they also are being very careful on how they're gathering any evidence, realizing that just about everything they do on site uh, will potentially be challenged in court by his attorneys. Absolutely. And speaking of his attorneys, we did reach out for comment. We have not yet heard back. Obviously, we want to hear his side. Uh, for Sean Combs's part, he has denied any allegations regarding sex trafficking and any investigation into that. But yeah, this this could take a lot of time in terms of uh, collecting that hard drive and flash drives and any computers they may find. Like I was mentioning before, Hal, it's, it's very difficult to know where someone would have that or would hide that if they were trying to hide evidence. And we're looking at a big, big mansion here. Uh, before we get back to you, Hal, let's go to Haley on the ground there. Hey, Sandra, yes, we just got that statement from the Department of Homeland Security that I was trying to get for you guys about 10 minutes ago. It doesn't say a whole lot, but it says this is attributed to Homeland Security Investigations. Earlier today, Homeland Security Investigations New York executed law enforcement actions as part of an ongoing investigation with assistance from HSI Los Angeles, HSI Miami, and our local law enforcement partners. We will provide further information as it becomes available, so nothing really that we haven't already told you. Uh, here on the scene on the ground, a lot of the law enforcement officers with Homeland Security have gone up the hill. You can see one of those big command vehicles coming out, one of those police vehicles. In the meantime, behind us, several of his friends, they've identified themselves as, have been trying to get through the crime scene to get to the house. But of course, LAPD not letting them through. We've tried to get comment from them on camera to find out if they have any more information about what's going on, but they haven't been able to, to uh, they don't want to provide us any information, I should say. Uh, and just in case you're just joining us, we have homes of P. Diddy being raided on both coasts, uh, Miami and his home here in Holmby Hills. So, Haley, just to clarify in that statement, did it, men it didn't mention Sean Combs, correct? Or anything? It doesn't, but we, <laughs> we have confirmation from multiple law enforcement sources that this does involve Sean Combs or P. Diddy. Mm -hmm. But no, this statement, I'll read it one more time, says, Earlier today, Homeland Security Investigations New York executed law enforcement actions as part of an ongoing investigation with assistance from both HSI Los Angeles, HSI Miami, and our local law enforcement partners. All right. We'll provide further information as it becomes available. Of course, we're trying to get them to talk to us on camera, but they said uh, the lady in particular who sent me the statement says so she's not allowed to. Thank you so much. Yeah, not really clarifying a whole lot, though, but clearly understandable because uh, right now, maybe they're not in position to divulge any more information. So let's bring in Hal Kemper here again from Homeland Security. Thank you so much for your expertise in all this. I don't know if you heard that statement, but didn't really say anything except that an investigation is underway in Miami and here. Uh, so clearly not stating who it involves or what the, the charges are. Uh, it doesn't, and they might be crime scenes. I should clarify, I'm not from Homeland Security, but I've worked in Homeland Security, and I've worked with Homeland Security Investigations uh, uh, over many years, uh, very familiar with uh, not only the agency, but also uh, very, very a lot of the individuals, a lot of the people who work there, to include here in Los Angeles especially. Uh, what they're probably looking at are the two residences, one in New York, one in Los Angeles, uh, without, it, and, and I, I haven't seen uh, the documentation, but if it doesn't name um, uh, Sean Combs by name, it's probably, probably because there's been allegations that criminal activity had taken place uh, tied to sex trafficking at these locations. So what they're doing is they're looking at the locations themselves and investigating them as potential crime scenes. And of course, with that, I'm sure uh, the scope is such that they can look just about anywhere, uh, gather up any materials. Uh, they're probably gathering up any electronic materials. They're probably uh, doing things like imaging the place, uh, taking a lot of pictures and stuff that may be used later. Uh, could be in reference to what uh, witnesses say uh, on the stand that they may look at, at various pictures of the locations themselves to help refresh their memory uh, while they're talking about various activities that may have taken place uh, or alleged to have taken place. So there's a lot of reasons why they might not focus on him per se. Uh, also, uh, there's another thing too, is he runs a fairly large organization. It, you know, uh, the fact that they don't name him might mean that they're looking at other activities that could have taken place within his immediate you know, entourage or his organization. Uh, that involve these properties. So uh, one can't rule out 
uh, anything at this point because we don't know a lot. Sure, and obviously this is just their statement to the press at this point. So what the actual legal documents say and what the statement they gave us is very, very different, let's be clear. So uh, we're sometimes, you know, not privy to all of those details and information until it becomes available at a later date. But uh, you were mentioning the whole search process. We are seeing so many law enforcement officials, investigators, and this is basically three properties on this entire, or three homes, I should say, buildings on this entire property in Holmby Hills we're talking about. How long is it going to take for them to go through it? Do they have a time limit? I mean, essentially, some people are going to come back into the home, right, at some point. So how does that all play out? I'm, I'm sure if you were to ask them, they'd say it's going to take as long as it takes. Mm. Uh, these are huge properties. Uh, you can imagine uh, looking through one home takes a, a lot of time. But when you have three very large buildings, uh, large buildings with a lot of different rooms, uh, various different levels on those homes, uh, also, they're going to be looking at every nook and cranny. They'll be looking at uh, anything, you know, that, that's, you know, subsurface in the home. They'll be looking in uh, basically everywhere they can. They could be using a variety of sensor systems to find out if there's any, um, you know, hidden compartments, uh, safes, things like that, and walls that aren't readily apparent. Uh, there could be a lot of different things they're looking for. Uh, and, and, you know, they may have dogs there, too, looking for various different things uh, as well. But they're probably looking for uh, more, more where stuff may be held, uh, I would imagine, uh, with that, and of course, anything tied to any of the allegations, we don't know. But uh, certainly, the fact that they're there indicates that they probably had, uh, you know, some some witnesses say that certain things happened or certain things were there when they were there, and they're probably trying to verify if those things are in fact there, if that if that what they were told is is correct. So there's there's probably just a lot of things that they're working through, checking off a list of stuff. And by the way, they may be looking on the grounds themselves. There could be stuff that's. Uh, uh, not necessarily in the buildings that are on the grounds, and of course they'd be looking at that as well. Uh, I imagine it's going to take quite some time with the property this big for them to work through all of the uh, potential spaces and places where, where various materials could be held. Kyle, thank you so much. We will have much more on Fox 11 at 5, and of course if we get more information, we'll break in once again. And now we resume for our original program. Hey, Scissor family. All right, so Andrew Kraft here now in the anchor chair uh, on Live Now from Fox. So you have been watching, and we're going to stay with this story. I know Fox 11 in Los Angeles uh, is going to other programming, but we know there's a lot of interest in this story. Yet again, um, we are, have been on this now for about 45 minutes. We want to put the pictures up uh, so you can see what is going on there overhead in the Holmby Hills section of Los Angeles. Uh, and this, from what we understand, is a multi-million dollar mansion connected to Diddy, the music mogul, the famous rapper, uh, and so it's not only there in Los Angeles that one of his homes that he is connected to is being raided by law enforcement, by Homeland Security investigators there, uh, but also his home in Miami, a home that is affiliated with him as well. So uh, if you're just joining us here, this is the top of a new hour. It's 2 o'clock here on the West Coast, 5 o'clock there on the East Coast as well, and so you can see um, this gorgeous multi-million dollar mansion that has now been raided by the feds in connection with what we are told is a federal sex trafficking investigation and you've been seeing there on the ground the numerous investigative agencies and law enforcement officials conduct this raid conduct this search as well we're going to be bringing in experts throughout this hour to kind of dive into the particularities of what an investigation like this entails here All right, so uh, in the meantime here, I just want to reset uh, as we continue to follow this story there, uh, overhead skybox of this uh, multi-million dollar mansion in the Holmby Hills section of Los Angeles. It's near Beverly Hills as well. So we're going to keep these pictures up. You see many of these kind of SWAT, Bearcat-like vehicles um, that are also on the scene as well. You see many investigators on the scene, uh, in addition to so many of these law enforcement officials, of these law enforcement investigators as well. So, uh, I'm Andrew Kraft. Thanks so much for being here with us as we continue to cover this story here. In the meantime, we just got a new live picture up overhead in Miami, Florida, of one of these residents that is connected to Diddy as well. We're going to put both of these shots on the screen, both in Los Angeles and in Miami. Let's put this up here. So, uh, this is what you can see right now. And I want to just kind of bring us back to how we got acquainted with this story. The Los Angeles home there of Diddy, 
was raided by Homeland Security today in connection with the federal sex trafficking investigation. Now, kudos to Fox 11 in Los Angeles. Uh, they were first on the scene. The federal raid there occurred in the lavish Holmby Hills neighborhood. Investigators said across the coast, the music mogul's Miami home was also raided today as well. So you're taking a live picture right now of both his home in Los Angeles and his home in Miami, Florida, as we speak, live, raw, and unfiltered. Now, uh, Fox 11's ground crew at the scene said the home in Los Angeles was registered to Bad Boys Films. It's a division of Bad Boy Entertainment, along with one of Combs's daughters. So, remember, um, we weren't exactly sure who was in the home at the time, either in Los Angeles or Miami. Uh, of course, these are mansions, thousands of square feet, many acred properties. So you would imagine, uh, and you're seeing kind of how the other half lives here, uh, that, you know, staffers at the home, possibly family, friends, assistants, what have you. We just don't know who was in the home at the time. Now, they had to make sure these homes were vacated before they can conduct kind of the peculiarities of the particularities of their investigation, kind of combing through. And you heard there from our friend Hal Kemper on Fox 11 say that they would be taking a lot of photos, that they would probably be taking a lot of electronics, like computer hard drives and, and devices and what have you. So, um, so we're going to leave this up. We know there's a lot of interest in this, in this case. Um, our friend, legal affairs journalist Megan Cuniff, she tweets this out. The civil lawsuits against Diddy sure beg the question of whether there's a criminal investigation, but the hugest red flag was back after the Cassie lawsuit was filed and there was an NYPD leak about a criminal probe. Now, you'll remember uh, that lawsuit filed by a former girlfriend of Diddy's, um, the prominent R&B star Cassie, uh, and there was some very, very damaging and disturbing claims made by Cassie against Diddy to the tune of sexual assault, uh, you know, degradation and, and the like. Uh, and then she retracted the suit. Jake has to run underscore C6 sent $5. Remember, she was asking, I believe, somewhere in the $30 million range of damages. Uh, but not, not, not within a week after that lawsuit was filed, it was dropped over in the hospital. Every day I wake so up, I hope I'm dreaming. Can't believe this shit. Can't believe you ain't here. Sometimes it's just hard for a nigga to wake up. It's hard to just keep going. Like I feel empty inside without you being here. When the raids took place. I would do anything to bring you back. I'd give all this shit up. This shit don't mean nothing. I saw your son today. Look just like you was the greatest. You'll always be the greatest. I miss you, baby. Can't wait till that day when I see your face again. To that day, that's coming to us from our um, partner WSBN down there. When I see his face Florida. again, so in the meantime, we're going to keep this up. We're going to be bringing in voices to help us make sense of this story. Why now? What could go into a probe like this, a federal sex trafficking probe? And who, if we find this out, might be is it Jenny herself? Is it not some of his associates? This right here goes out to everyone that has lost someone. Seems like yesterday we used to rock the show. I laced the track, you locked the flow. So far from hanging on the block of dough. Notorious, they got to know that. Life ain't always what it seemed to be. Words can't express what you mean to me. Even though you're gone, we still a team. Through your family, I'll fulfill your dreams. In the future, can't wait to see. If you open up the gates for me, reminisce sometime. 
night that he took my friend I try to black it out but it plays again when it's real feelings hard to conceal can't imagine all the pain i feel give anything to hear half your breath i know you're still living your life after death Jcaster underscore C6 sent five dollars. Regardless of the statute of limitations, that was somewhat of a groundbreaking law uh, in New York passed to allow those victims of sexual abuse and sexual assault to file their claims. Every day I wake up, that the statute of limitations had expired. I hope I'm dreaming. So I'm only saying this because I think it's important to. I can't believe this shit. Sometimes it's just hard for a nigga to wake up. It's just hard to just keep going. It's like I feel empty inside without you being here. And what we are told, Fox 11 Los Angeles, saying this is an inve- investigation, federal one at that, into sex trafficking. I don't do anything. In the meanwhile here, like I said, we talk about back. some of our experts, legal analysts, uh, law enforcement experts. Who give all this shit up. Know a thing or two about these shit don't mean nothing. We're going to keep the live pictures up. We're going to hear some of these voices, though, right now, including our friend, uh, attorney and expert. I saw your son today. Look just like you. He was the greatest. He will always be the greatest. I miss you, babe. Can't wait till that day when I see your face again. Prosecuted and dealt with a lot of these cases in the past. And for people who don't know, what is the legal bar to reach the statute definition of sex trafficking in the United States? What do you think? Right here, tell me why. Goes out to everyone that has lost someone that truly loved. Check it out. Seems like yesterday we used to rock the show. I laced the track, you locked the flow. So far from hanging on the block for dope. 
Notorious, they got to know that Life ain't always what it seemed to be Words can't express what you mean to me Even though you're gone, we still a team Through your family, I'll fulfill your dreams In the future, can't wait to see If you open up the gates for me Reminisce sometime, the night they took my friend Try to black it out, but it plays again When it's real, feelings hard to conceal Can't imagine all the pain I feel Give anything to hear half the breath I know you're still living your life after death just for questioning and then maybe release them later or or do they know who they're looking for are they going to these raids to arrest people is what i'm asking sometimes the answer is both and sometimes the uh, warrant actually says it's a search and arrest warrant so they're there to actually arrest certain individuals who they do believe are suspects and sometimes they're just search warrants which means they're there to gather information they have some very particular information they have to give a judge in order to get a judge to sign off on a warrant because you can see there by looking at the screen yourself i mean this is a very invasive process they're going into the home of an individual and there has to be reason enough to believe that what they're looking for is going to be in that home and they have to secure all of the individuals walking around in that home or detain them uh, to make sure that they don't dispose of evidence uh, or move evidence or do something to potentially damage the investigation. So it may not be that everyone in that home is a suspect. It could be that everyone in the home is a suspect or it could be some combination. Okay, you know, that makes that makes sense. You know, um, we're getting some reporting in from our friend Megan Cuniff. She's a legal affairs journalist in Los Angeles. Um, she says this, and if we could go back to the one about the jurisdiction, because I think the jurisdiction is really, really important. You know, it, it might not necessarily be that, you know, prosecutors in L.A. or Miami are bringing this. This could be somewhere else, and they could have asked the, you know, local state law enforcement to conduct this. Megan Cuniff says this, Nicole, Diddy's home is being raided in Los Angeles, but I've confirmed with the U.S. Attorney's Office the case is not out of L.A.'s Central District of California. Uh, and Megan says the Southern District of New York is most likely. Now, that would track with the statement Fox 11 Los Angeles reporter Haley Winslow on the scene got from Homeland Security investigators from New York. So that would potentially lead many to believe, lead us to believe that this could be coming out of New York. That's where the nucleus of the investigation is, so to speak. I don't want to say that's confirmed, but that's what we're somewhat hearing. I think that's absolutely possible. And it's possible that even though there's not maybe a federal investigation going on in the California district or even in Miami, they uh, have given a judge enough information to believe that it is reasonable to expect that evidence of the crime being prosecuted or investigated in New York is at these two locations. That's what they would have to show the judge in order to get the warrant. And it could be that maybe not now, they're not looking at a, a particular charge in either of these districts in Florida or in California, but you know, really it depends on what they find here. Um, right now they believe evidence of a crime committed in New York is to be found at the location in Los Angeles and Miami. 
it's possible that what they uncover could lead them to believe that also there was a potential crime in those jurisdictions and they would not be foreclosed from being able to investigate those crimes, even though that's not what the warrant initially set out to find. You know, so is it customary for where the warrants are served, you would make the leap that the crimes were committed in these places, correct? That That's safe to say, the alleged crimes, so to speak, that's why the raids are being held as we speak? Not necessarily. It could be that they believe evidence of those crimes can be found in those locations. So in other words, it could be a crime they believe occurred in New York, but they have reason to believe and it's strong enough information that they were able to get a judge to sign off on a warrant to indicate that evidence of the crime that is being investigated in New York can be found in Los Angeles or Miami. So it's not necessarily so that they believe the crime itself happened in either Los Angeles or Miami, um, although it could evolve that that later turns out to be the case. You know, Nicole, uh, like I said, you have a lot of experience in prosecuting these cases, um, but we are watching federal agents raid two mansions, thousands of square feet, multiple acres. That's a lot of ground to cover. There are going to be, you could imagine, thousands of pieces of evidence. I mean, these are large, large properties here. That's completely true, and I've had an opportunity to defend quite a few of these cases, and these cases are indeed complex. Uh, not only do you have a, an instance where you have just the idea that these cases can have terabytes and terabytes of information, which are later produced to the defense team, but you have two locations now that are just very large where they're gathering this information from. So I can expect whoever is ultimately representing Mr. Diddy to uh, Mr. Combs to have to sift through incredible amounts of physical and digital evidence just to try to find out exactly what these accusations are about. Yeah, unfortunately, it looks like um, Sky Fox there in, a, in Los Angeles is going to be uh, flying away. We still have our live picture, though, uh, in Miami as well. What's the coordination and cooperation like now that this is looking like a bi-coastal operation and investigation. How hard is it, Nicole, to get everyone on the same page, to get everyone on board with this is what we're looking for, this, you know, maybe who we need to question, who we need to detain. Is that is that a very heavy lift, so to speak? It is a heavy lift, and you can imagine that there were hours and hours of planning that went into the execution right down to who would be involved on each team, um, because it has to be something that is not leaked. It is coordinated as to timing, and you have two completely different time zones. Um, and so you want to make sure that every person on each of those teams is going in at the same time because you don't want whoever you're trying to investigate to learn that you're looking for documents in one location because they could quickly uh, secrete them or hide them, destroy them in the secondary location. So this has to happen at the same time. Um, it also is best if it happens at the same time because you don't want witnesses talking to each other about what the other one said before law enforcement has an opportunity to talk to these folks. So it is a very heavy lift. It, it takes a lot of coordination, and you want to make sure that everyone on the team knows what their role is and what they're supposed to be doing and not supposed to be doing. Okay, so we're taking a live picture right now, Nicole, there uh, in Miami at the residence, one of the residences of Diddy there. Um, I want to show for the viewers that we're going to bring you on camera here, Nicole. We want to thank you for being with us. Um, we're going to keep you around for just a little bit longer because this is a developing story, a breaking story at the moment. Uh, we're going to get back to that live picture in just a moment. Uh, I want to show uh, our viewers and take them back about how we even came to be familiar and acquainted with this story. We were watching this on one of our feeds, uh, oh, about an hour ago now, and we were watching agents raid a home, so to speak. We have that moment. I want to get you to respond to that moment. This is it here. So. Um, Take a look at this. All right. You see there so many of these agents. They're trying to break down one of these front doors or at least gain access to it. And so presumably, you know, this is what they train for. This is how they go about this. Do they have to do this in every raid, so to speak? You know, if, if you're not getting pushback or opposition or there's no danger posed from any of the individuals in the house, why do they have to have such manpower like this? Well, it does not mean that they believe that there's danger involved, but you can see that these officers are not taking anything for granted. They're there in uniform. They're clearly identifiable as law enforcement. They have what appears to be bulletproof vests on just in case something goes wrong. Uh, they have a certain lineup. They know uh, in that stack, if you will, you know, person who is going to be in front all the way down to the person who is going to be at the back. They know who's responsible for breaching the doorway. And it's not the kind of thing you can see there's such a difference all the way from where the gate to that property that we're looking at now is all the way to the front door of the actual residence. There's some time. So what law enforcement does not typically want to do is ring the doorbell and have a little chat with whoever's on the inside of the house so that if somebody has a flash drive or something that they might want to flush down the toilet or uh, otherwise remove from the residence or somehow hide, they have time to deal with it. These law enforcement officers have a plan and they're executing a plan where they also want the element of surprise to be on their side. Oh, I see. Okay, that makes sense. You know, 
being in the news, uh, I think the last kind of federal raid in the public consciousness was the raid at Mar-a-Lago in South Florida back in August of 2022. And we saw that kind of all unfold as well. Of course, I'm not comparing these two situations or scenes by any means, but these were essentially, Nicole, raids that we all watched in real time. And so I think a lot of the American people and viewers became pretty well acquainted with how law enforcement does this. Uh, now, let's talk about the probe itself. We're getting that from our sources at Fox 11, that this is an investigation regarding allegations of sex trafficking federally. Now, is that federal aspect important to this? Obviously, states have their own laws on the books when it comes to sex trafficking. But if the feds are looking into this, into homes associated with such a high profile person, uh, you just have to kind of make the leap that this is going to be a story for a very long time. What is so particular about the federal aspect of this? Again, it's very likely that it is federal because they believe there was some element of crossing state lines uh, with some of the conduct. And again, without seeing the warrant, without we, if we don't see the warrant, we can't see the affidavit. We don't know exactly what the government is alleging occurred here. Um, we're taking a guess uh, based on some civil lawsuit information that this is probably what this is about. It's clearly a criminal investigation at this point uh, because you see this law enforcement individuals making entry and conducting this this warrant, this search warrant at a minimum. We don't know if it's also an arrest warrant. Um, and so it, it has to be that there's some interstate commerce or some crossing of state lines that was affected to make this a federal case. Um, and the reality is, is that even though a person may have a peaceful reputation, I know nothing about Mr. Combs' reputation. Um, the law enforcement needs to go in as if the situation could turn violent at any time because these types of allegations are incredibly serious. Somebody who is ultimately arrested for human trafficking uh, could very well, depending on the charges, uh, go to prison for the rest of their lives. And that's a desperate corner for individuals to be in. And even um, people who might otherwise not have had a history of any sort of violent reaction, law enforcement has to be prepared for the unexpected. And so that's what you're seeing here. You know, Nicole, I was using some of the history and context of what Diddy has gone through over the last three months to kind of bring into this story a little bit. And, you know, we don't want to jump to conclusions or, or you know, draw connections that aren't there. But he has suffered a lot uh, of legal drama, so to speak, over the last three months, um, you know, almost like weekly uh, allegations being made, lawsuits being filed against him for allegations, Nicole, that go back to the early to late 90s. And we mentioned that a lot of states now have some of these laws on the books where they open a window of time, say a year, and victims can come forward no matter the statute of limitations. Uh, do you think we could possibly be seeing that be taken advantage of, uh, any laws like that in a case like this? Well, it depends on if the government believes that there was some kind of a conspiracy uh, to continue with human trafficking or essentially to uh, bring people into compelled prostitution. If they believe that there is an ongoing conspiracy, for example, um, among people to do this, uh, at, you know, and there's evidence that either of these Combs residents of that thing that they're accusing them of over the long term, it can tack back in time that way. So in other words, if you know the conspiracy they're alleging is still ongoing this last year, and I don't know what they're alleging, because again, we haven't seen any documentation of that, uh, but they could say, well, it's the same com conspiracy that's been ongoing for 20, 20 oh. plus years. And so you know that would mean that potentially, although there would definitely be arguments in court, that they could say, well, this is the same conspiracy. It was going on as of yesterday. And for that reason, we believe that we are going to be able to continue to prosecute no matter how old some of the initial complainants in the conspiracy were at the time. So those could be 20 years old. I mean, these, these cases are incredibly burdensome for a defense team. They're expensive, they're enormously stressful. I mean, if you can imagine also, you know, he's presumed innocent. Uh, it is presumed that he's done absolutely nothing wrong, which is really a hard thing for us to imagine watching what we're watching right now on, on camera. And for a defendant accused in a case of this nature, um, you know, especially with so much time uh, potentially being at issue for witnesses to make claims, um, it's almost like having to prove a negative that it didn't happen, even though sure. that's not what our Constitution or criminal no. court uh, rules require. So, um, of course, we don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but you are saying the very fact that these homes affiliated with Diddy are being raided in this fashion, it would be hard to, you know, down the line, you would be surprised, to, so to speak, if Diddy wasn't somewhat implicated in that. that that's what my line of questioning is to you. You know, how likely is it that a family member, an employee, a, a staffer uh, on the grounds, or, so to speak, that they are involved primarily and that the homes just so happen to be owned by Sean Diddy Combs? Is that unlikely or likely in your in your history? 
you know, just the fact that they're his residences do, uh, you know, that, that does bring concern that they believe anyway that uh, evidence of, of a serious federal crime is located in Combs's home, uh, which leads one to believe that at a minimum they think that potentially there is some involvement. I mean, his home is involved because they got a judge to sign off on a warrant saying evidence of this serious crime is in it. Sure. So he's got a battle ahead. Yeah. You know, um, I'm going to step away right now from these live pictures. Um, Nicole, I want to get your thoughts on this piece of video from how this all kicked off here. Okay, so you see there, this is in the Holby Hills neighborhood there in Los Angeles. Um, investigators detained someone, Nicole, and you, you see this right here. This is video, this is not live, this is from earlier. Um, and I guess my question to you is, you know, what comes first, kind of the chicken or the egg, the indictment or the raid, or the raid or the indictment? Which comes first? Because you see there, they're detaining people on the ground. This was, what, maybe an hour ago. No doubt they're going to be questioned, possibly booked, uh, not sure if they're going to be charged. We just don't know any of that. But presumably one has to happen for the other, right? You know, believe it or not, it doesn't. Uh, they can actually uh, do, ex they can execute a search warrant without charges being filed based on essentially a criminal complaint. So, I mean, no indictment in that instance. And sometimes they indict a case and they don't have everybody that they think is responsible listed in that indictment. Or the grand jury hasn't indicted everybody who they think is a part of the case. Um, and so, you know, it, it, just because you're seeing people on TV right now who are, you know, being arrested, searched, handcuffed, detained, uh, set aside, doesn't mean that they're criminal defendants or criminal suspects. It could very well be that those are witnesses that were watching them secure. Okay. So there's there's no way to know yet, you know, who is being charged if there has been a charge. And sometimes indictments have been issued but are sealed and have to be unsealed by a federal judge so that we know what are the charges. Yeah, all right, let's go back out live to the pictures we have there, both in Los Angeles uh, and in Miami. You know, um, Nicole DeBoard uh, with us here on the phone. Uh, can't thank you enough. This has been really invaluable for helping us make sense of this. But if you're Diddy's legal team right now, they've been working overtime for the last, what, three, four months in unrelated cases. Uh, now I would imagine that, you know, their year has gotten so much more difficult. What lies ahead for them? H how much harder is their job going to be, depending on whatever the charges are, whoever the defendants may be going forward? You know, they're just going to have a massive amount of information to sift through, and that's if the government gives it to them. So the government first is going to, to get all of this information, and this can get really complicated for the legal team. So, you know, up until this morning, when all of these raids started, the legal team had access to, if they wanted to go to Mr. Combs and say, I would like to see what you have on this computer, he could go to his computer and he could get it. Well, you can bet that all of those items are going to be removed from these residences, and so now they're not accessible to the legal team until the government turns it over and the agents turn it over for review and for discovery, and that can take a while. So when the government takes possession of all the materials that you're using to try to understand allegations like this, the burden is just incredible. So it's going to take a ton of time for these lawyers and their legal teams to sift through this information and to try to calculate what they're even missing. You know, what, what did the government take that we need access to to make sure that Mr. Combs gets due process, if that's in fact what happens, that he's charged at all in these allegations? Yeah, and um, Nicole, like I said, we can't thank you enough, um, but these are really incredible scenes um, that we are seeing, you know, not just one, but two federal raids happening in real time as we speak. So I think that is, you know, somewhat significant in the nature of this story and the possible high profile would be defendant. And you see there in Los Angeles, look at all of those investigators going up the driveway there in, in the mansion. And so we'll just have to wait and see, but hopefully we'll get some type of statement from, from Sean Combs, from his legal team, from his representatives there. But you can see there, Nicole, kind of a large mass of these investigators walking into the driveway uh, and going into the home right there as well. You know, depending, and we were talking about this kind of, but you know, these homes are massive. So would you presume that these raids, these searches, I mean, they're gonna go on for hours. You can make that. They're gonna go for possibly days. Oh, I mean, the reality is, is that they need to, um, you know, op open every drawer. I mean, they're looking for things most likely, like uh, could be thumb drives, computer disks, documents, photographs, um, anywhere that they can argue anyway as law enforcement that items of that nature could be concealed. They have to look. And in a house like this, I would imagine there are many drawers, many cabinets, many closets, and potentially many electronic devices. They're gonna be looking for phones. They're gonna be looking for tablets. They're gonna be looking for security footage. They're going to be looking for anything that might record data or receive an email or send a text. So there is just a ton of work ahead for these investigators. All right, uh, Nicole DeBoard, we can't thank you enough. Uh, and maybe we'll check in a little bit later or tomorrow, depending on how this story uh, unfolds here. Nicole DeBoard, thanks so much. Thanks for having me. All right, in the meantime here, uh, we're going to stay with this story. Uh, we're also going to pivot to another major breaking news story that's been unfolding there in the Los Angeles area over the course of the last few days. I want to put this shot up here. Uh, you see there, uh, you can see the Dodgers. 
the emblem, the logo on the back of those two chairs. We're about to get a statement in about, oh, five minutes' time, at least that's when it's been scheduled, uh, from the MLB star and Dodgers star, new Dodgers star, Shohei Otani, uh, over um, these allegations uh, in this betting scandal that has really rocked the sports world and rocked the MLB over the course of the last uh, three or four days. So we're going to be bringing in my colleague here, Andy Mack. You're going to be hearing uh, from Otani here at this um, scheduled press conference. We'll see how long it is. We'll see whether or not he takes questions. And then we'll be kind of diving into the particulars of the case itself. How did this all get started? We'll have that and more in two minutes. And welcome back here to Live Now from Fox. I'm Andrew Kraft. Thanks for being with us on a busy Monday. Hope you had a good weekend. Let's get more into these top stories. Of course, we still have our eye on what's happening there at the Holmby Hills mansion of Sean Diddy Combs. This is a live picture right there. You can see many of his luxury vehicles parked in the driveway as some of these federal investigators raid and pour over these homes, not only in Los Angeles, but also in Miami. And what we are told is an ongoing federal sex trafficking investigation. That's about all we know at this hour. It's a story we have to stay on top of as well. We're staying in Los Angeles for our next story as well. Take a look at this shot that we have right here. We are about to hear from LA Dodgers star Shohei Otani. He's set to make his first public comments today since his former interpreter, Ipe Mitsuhara, was fired following allegations of illegal gambling and theft from the LA Dodgers star. So in the newsroom here, I have my colleague, uh, Andy Mack. It does look like we have Shohei Otani sitting down. Let's listen. Okay, so yeah, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, I want to point out Shoei interpreter Will Irett, N W I L L I R E T O N. Uh, we just need not film this right now uh, uh, on your cell phone if that's possible. Um, and after Shoei's done, uh, we will not be taking questions. Thanks. Eh, first, everyone, come here. I want to thank you. I talked about it, so I want to thank you. I'm happy to be here. Eh, my team and my colleagues, everyone, I'm myself, but the fans, everyone, have been here for a few weeks. え、1 well, first of all, thank you very much for coming. Uh, I wanted to be here uh, today to be able to talk. Uh, I'm sure it was very tough. It's been a tough week for fans and team officials, and I'm very grateful that the media has been patient, patient in this process. Uh, just on a personal note, uh, I'm very saddened and shocked that someone who I'm trusted has done this. え、so obviously today there's things that I'm limited in being able to talk about. I hope you understand. Uh, I do have a document in front of me that I will refer to uh, that will detail what has happened. Uh, 
、えー、それをまた頼んだり、えー、っていうことはないですし、えーまあ、僕の口座からブックメーカーに対して、えー、誰かに送金を依頼したことももちろん全く、えー、ありません。So, I never bet on baseball or any other sports, or never have asked somebody to do it on my behalf.、Uh, and I have never、uh, w e n t through a bookmaker、uh, to bet on sports. I have never been through a bookmaker to bet on sports. I have never been through a bookmaker to bet on sports. I have never been through a bookmaker to bet on sports. まあ、みんな僕の周りもそうですねみんなに、えー、まあ嘘をついていたというのが、えー、まあ結論から言うとそういうことになります。Um, just to kind of just go over the result,、uh, in conclusion,、uh, Ipe has been stealing money from my account and has told lies.、えーまあ、まず、はじめに言うと先週末、えー、韓国ですね、えー、僕の代理人に対してメディアの、えー、方から、えー、私が、えー、僕のようにですね、えー、違法のブックメーカーから、えー僕が、えー、関与しているのではないかというスポーツ博士に賭博について、えー、関与しているのではないかという打診があり連絡がありました。Uh, last weekend in Korea,、um, media has reached out to a representative in my camp,、um, inquiring about my my potential involvement in this sports betting. で一平さんは僕にこういった取材の依頼があるということをまず、えー、僕には話していなかったし、僕の方にそういう連絡はまず来ていなかったということと。えー、まずはじめに代理人には、えー、一平さんは僕と話して分かったのは、えー、一平さんにではなく、えー、某友人の借金の肩代わりとして、えー、支払ったというふうに、えー、僕の代理人も含めてみんなに話してました。So, 一平 never revealed to me that there was this media, media inquiry, and、uh, to the representatives to, in my camp, he told, 一平 told、uh, to the media and to my representatives that I, you know, on behalf of a friend,、uh, paid off. Uh, debt. でその翌日にさらに尋問で一平さんは、えー、僕たちの代理人に対して、えー、借金は自分のものあつまり一平さん自身が作ったものだということを、えーいえーまあ、説明しました。でそれを僕が、まあ、肩代わりしたという話を、えー、その時に代理人に話したと。そしてこれらは全く、えー、全てが嘘だったということです。And this, this, all of this has been a complete lie. Ipe さんは取材依頼のことも僕にはもちろん、えー、その時伝えていなかったですし、代理人の人たちに対しても、えー、僕はすでに彼と話して、えー、彼と話してコミュニケーションを取っていたということを、えー、嘘をついていました。<笑> so Ipe、um, obviously lied about, you know, basically didn't tell me about the media inquiry. And then その代表に対して、うん、あの僕もそうだし、代表、えー、チームもそうですね。チームも、えー、代理の人たち。に対しても、えーまあ、つまり僕とコミュニケーションを取っていたというふうに嘘ついてました。So Ipe has been telling everybody around that he that Ipe has been communicating with Shohei on all of this account to my representative, you know, to my representative to the team, and that hasn't been true.、えー、そして僕がこのギャンブルに関しての問題を初めて知ったのは、えー、韓国での第一戦が終わった後に行われたチームミーティング、えー、のとあの試合の後のチームミーティングの時です。The first time I knew about this. Gambling,、uh, Ipe's gambling was during the、uh, after the first game when we had team meeting in the clubhouse.、えーまあ、And、えーえー、so he was telling everyone during the team meeting, obviously, Ipe was speaking English and I didn't have a translator on my side. But, with, but even with that, I kind of understood what was going on and started to feel. Um, that there was something、uh, amiss. Just prior to the meeting, I was told by Ipe, hey, let's talk one to one in the hotel after the meeting. So I waited until then. で僕は一平さんがその時にギャンブルあのミーティングの時にギャンブルの依存症だっていうのは僕はもちろん知らなかったですし彼が借金をしていることもその時そのミーティングの時はもちろん知りませんでした。So up until that team meeting, I didn't know that Ip had a gambling addiction and was in debt. で僕は彼の借金返済にももちろん同意その時も同意してませんし、ブックメーカーに対して彼に送金をしてくれと頼んだことももちろん許可したことももちろんないです。And at that obviously at that point, or I and obviously I did not never agreed to pay off the debt or you know make payments to the、uh, bookmaker. でまあ、その後試合後ホテルに、えー、戻って一平さんと初めてそこで話をして、えー、彼に巨額の借金があることをその時知りました。And finally when we went back to the hotel and talked one to one, that was when I was、uh, when I found out that he had a massive、uh, debt.
で彼はその時私に、えー、僕の口座を勝手に僕の口座に勝手にアクセスしてブックメーカーに送信,あ送金していたということを僕に伝えました。And it was revealed to me during that meeting that he, Ipeo, admitted that he was sending money、uh, using my account to the bookmaker. でまあ僕はやっぱりおかしい、これはおかしいなと思って、えー、代理人に話したいということで代理人たちを呼んでそこで話し合いました。And at that moment, obviously I was, it was an absurd thing that was happening and I've contacted my representatives at that point. でも話し終わってこれを聞いて僕の代理人もやっぱり彼に嘘をつかれていたということを、えー、初めて知って、えー、すぐにドジャースの皆さんと、えー、弁護士の人たちにその時に連絡しました。So when, my, when I was finally able to talk to my representatives, that's when my representatives found out that Ipe has been lying the whole time, and that's when I started contacting the Dodgers and my lawyers. でまあそのドジャースの皆さんも、えー、代理人の人たちもその彼らもその時に初めてまた自分たちも嘘をつかれていたということをその時に知りました。And the Dodgers and the lawyers at that moment Found out also as well that they have been lied to. そして僕が弁護士の人たちはこれは窃盗と詐欺のことなのでこれを警察の当局に引き渡すという報告をその時にしました。My lawyers recommended that, you know, since this is a theft and fraud, that, that we have the proper authorities handle this matter. まあこれがそこまでの流れなので僕はもちろんスポーツとバックにはもちろん関与していないですし、ブックメーカーにさっきも言いましたけど送金をしていたという事実は全くえありません。So, you know, in conclusion, I do want to make it clear that I never bet on sports or have willfully、uh, sent money、uh, to the bookmaker. You know, to summarize how I'm feeling right now, I'm just beyond shocked. It's really hard to、uh, verbalize how I am feeling at this point.、まあえーえー、すすえー、and the season is going to start, so I'm going to obviously let my lawyers handle、uh, matters from here on out, and I am、uh, completely assisting、uh, in all investigations. That are taking place right now. なのでまあ気持ちを切り替えるのは難しいですけどもシーズンに向けて、えー、またスタートしたいですし、えー、今日まずお話しできてよかったなとも思っているので、えーまあ、今日は質疑応答は、えー、これが今お話しできる全てなので質疑応答はしませんが、えー、これから、えー、さらに進んでいくと思います。You know, I'm looking forward to focusing on the season. I'm, I'm glad that we had this opportunity to talk、um, and I'm sure there will be、uh, continuing investigations moving forward. 以上です。ありがとうございました。Thank you very much. All right,、uh, there you just heard from LA Dodgers star Shohei Otani with his now、uh, new translator and interpreter there、uh, as he defended himself completely、uh, against these、uh, allegations that both he and his former friend and interpreter、uh, were gambling、uh, on sports. He said, I never bet, and someone on my behalf never bet for him. He says he was unaware that his former interpreter and translator, Ipe Mitsuhara, Had a gambling addiction and was deep in debt. He says all of this is a complete lie. Joining me right now in the newsroom, my friend and colleague Andy Mack.、Um, Andy, we're going to break this down、uh, and we're going to talk about you know, how we got here, why Shohei Otani had to feel the need to come out and explain himself there, remaining very defiant, saying he was unaware of this, saying this is all a fabrication and a lie against him, saying he never gambled or bet. On sports. Your reaction first to what we just heard. Yeah, there are a lot of layers to this one, to say the least, Andrew Kraft, about Shohei Otani, the $700 million man after signing this 10 year deal with the Dodgers to kind of switch sides in Los Angeles. And I want to echo what he said and, and obviously what you pointed out. He said, quote, I have never bet on baseball. And that has kind of overshadowed a lot of this about this betting scandal as his interpreter, Ipe Mizuhara, was fired. Obviously, there's questions about whether he potentially bet through him or what happened there.、Uh, but he coming out very defiantly saying, I have ne bet, never bet on baseball, saying very sad and very shy. At something that he can trust. And of course, he came over from Japan, and this, this relationship with the interpreter goes back a decade since they were playing in Japan. Of course, he joined the, the、uh, Angels in 2018, won his end rookie of the year, won multiple MVPs. So, this relationship, and like you heard, he said it was thought he was someone he could trust. And that is very, very interesting because they spent so much time together there, not only communicating. Between the translator and the media, but between teammates, between coaches, between all of these things. And the fact that Shohei Otani says he had no idea that this was going on behind the scenes. He learned of this during that potential meeting in Korea. And of course, last week, the Dodgers and the Padres they kicked off the 
baseball season early mornings here in the United States but over there obviously an international game as well of course in South Korea those games being played and he learned about it for the first time so we're still trying to piece together maybe what happened Ipe as Otani says it lying told him lies after lies about what was going on told him lies to the team told the lies to the Dodgers told lies to Otani so uh, there is so much to get into and yeah. and kind of what is going on there and there's a lot of things to unpack and a lot of questions that still are left unanswered because as you also saw there he did not take any questions from the media and you right. imagine there's a lot of stuff swir swirling around the Dodgers they are a major market team they're accustomed to all this uh, different press and media but this no answering no questions they want to focus on the baseball season which begins in earnest before the rest of the teams this week right we'll see if that happens but it's a lot to unpack there and this whole story has been wild since it broke last week yeah, you're right. You know, there's somewhat, you know, leaves a stench this week on the whole beginning of the baseball season, opening day later this week. Now, the MLB and the Dodgers organization kind of ensconced in this scandal. Let's go over some of the facts, too, uh, before we just heard from Otani. Um, so, Mitsuhara was fired by the Dodgers last week uh, when the team, like you mentioned, opened the season there between the Padres in Seoul, South Korea. Um, he was also now is at the center of an investigation opened by the MLB. And the IRS has confirmed Mitsuhara and Matthew Bowyer, the alleged illegal bookmaker in Orange County, California, are under criminal investigation. You know, um, Andy, you could tell from Otani uh, via his interpreter that there's a sense of just despondency and betrayal that someone so close to him uh, is capable of this, is capable uh, of these allegations. And he wanted to absolve himself from all responsibility and even connection to this person. He says... Whatever Ipe Mitsuhara said he did and said I did, that's not true, that's a lie. Yeah, and like you said there, of course, there's a lot to, of lies to unpack there. And, of course, he's a very uh, unemotional person. But, uh, of course, we are following it also very, very closely. There's a lot of layers in terms of just that relationship as well and the fact that he did not know that he had a gambling addiction, that Otani was close. And you kind of look back to what happened last week in these games in Korea. As people were watching early morning hours, overnight hours, you looked in the dugout and there were shots of Otani joking with Ipe, even as recently as Tuesday into Wednesday. So uh, the fact that he did not know about it, is that what he says, uh, is really just kind of hard to like wrap your mind around because they spend so much time with them and, and covering the major league baseball covering different uh, international born players translators have been known to play catch with otani i covered kenta maeda who is also a japanese born player his translator his interpreter was basically his best buddy on the team they played catch together so uh while Ipe is there just to translate to work for Otani, uh, he actually, Otani actually brought him over from Japan right. when he did move there. Uh, so there's a lot in terms of that. But we also want to mention the fact that obviously betting and baseball do not go together. And I think when everyone talks about betting and baseball, they think notably of Pete Rose. And I think a lot of baseball purists are very concerned about this because obviously Pete Rose, the all time hit leader, not in the Hall of Fame for betting on baseball. And they don't hope this next generation star, this star of the new age that can both pitch, that can hit home runs, that can do it all seemingly on the field this babe ruth type player in the new age game potentially had somewhat some involvement so there are just so many different facets of this that make it so interesting and of course otani also a very guarded individual we did not know a ton of information about him uh, as well and of course the japanese born uh, player he's more comfortable speaking in japanese but even as most recently as january at a awards show he did speak in english he did have an award where he accepted the mvp spoke in english although it was on a statement as well so he is uh, very much aware of this but also uh, guarded in that fact so um and correct me if i'm wrong maybe you know this maybe you don't we're just watching some file footage uh, of otani yep. is that mitsuhara next to him correct yes that is him okay yep. you know um andy mitsuhara told espn he had gambling debts that totaled well over a million dollars and initially said otani had paid those off at his request he later changed that story telling espn otani had no knowledge of the gambling debts and had not transferred any money to bookmakers so uh in the last few days it does seem like he changed his story yep. to kind of you know absolve any alleged involvement Otani might have had in this story. But but you mentioned um, Mitsuhara is basically persona non grata right now in the Dodgers organization within the MLB. And Andy, if you could, because I think it's important, because we're at the rise of sports betting. And if you're a fan, you can bet on anything really that you want. But if you are a Major League Baseball player, if you are part of that organization, you cannot bet on that very same organization, right? I think that distinction is so important to be made. Yeah, and of course, like you said, obviously it might not be Shohei Otani betting on the game. He said, I have never bet on baseball, but if there's any sort of connection, any information, because Ipe uh, Mizuhara is in the clubhouse on yeah. a consistent basis, has so much access to information that people that are setting the lines, the general public has, he does not have. So there is a, a big no-no rule in Major League Baseball that you cannot have any affiliation with gambling. And like you said, there's a lot to be made now about sports betting. And of course, we've seen recently in 
the NFL. Calvin Ridley sitting out an entire year based on sports betting. He is obviously a wide receiver. He came back, made a big splash as well. But that suspension kind of shook shockwaves through it all. And of course, we are continuing that as well. And of course, I also found it interesting. They were talking about the fact that there was a meeting in Korea in the clubhouse talking with Ipe, making these comments about him telling the team. And Otani was sitting there. He didn't understand him because Ipe was not interpreting for him. And he didn't really understand the conversation that was going on with the team. Uh, and of course, Dave Roberts has come out, the manager for the uh, Dodgers, coming out and saying that he has, quote, Otani has had one-off conversations with players. So he really hasn't brought it up with any of his teammates about it uh, as they want to focus on the season. So that team meeting there in Korea, I think is going to get a lot of attention on okay. what Ipe said to the players and maybe how he did not uh, tell Otani about that. And Otani was just kind of oblivious to this, just sure. not knowing exactly what Ipe said in that moment. You know, to your point, it did seem like in that press conference, Otani was completely caught unawares uh, and caught so off guard by the allegations themselves. He made uh, several references to a media inquiry, and correct me if I'm wrong, maybe that media inquiry was looking into these allegations that kicked all of this off that uh, Mitsuhara tried to keep from Otani and other Dodgers, but that's how they got word that this scandal was brewing. So you're right, and we heard there from Otani, and that's kind of where I got the kind of the sense of betrayal, yep. um, that they had to wait for a media inquiry, presumably from a reporter looking into this, to find out Mitsuhara had all this gambling debt, he was addicted to gambling, and initially was kind of trading off Otani's name in order to pay back his bookies and get out of this. That's what it seems like to me. Yeah, that initial media inquiry potentially coming to Ipe, and Ipe not directly telling Otani. Otani yeah. has to fo follow up and, and learn about this later on after there's a little bit of digging from the media. So that is, like you said, the betrayal of trust between uh, Mitsuharo and Otani as well. Uh, so we'll see what happens. And of, of course, we have not really seen or heard from Mizuhara as well. He was fired after that game there in Korea. We don't even know if he's back in the United States. That is something that is also uh, a key piece to this as well, because of course, they they're interpreting for uh, Otani right now is just a member of the Dodgers staff that interprets for other Japanese born players. Of course, they just signed uh, Yoshida Yamamoto as well, another Japanese born player. So, of course, big Japanese ties in uh, the uh, Major League Baseball. And I just want to note, because obviously I haven't brought this up yet, just the frenzy around Otani and Japanese media, because those are stars here in Major League Baseball. But internationally, in Japan, they are just superheroes to people yeah. over there. So, that is another component because, of course, you have so much media covering Otani here there there are dozens of reporters I think dozens might be an understatement covering Otani in Los Angeles with all of this and of course uh, this is a tweet coming in as well Otani said that Ipe had been telling people that he was communicating with Shohei which he said wasn't true he said he first learned about the clubhouse following the Korea series game so we were kind of spot on there kind of sure. learning uh, throwing but just the media inquiry and of course we also had tweets about this just the frenzy in Los Angeles but to see that much media uh, people kind of following Otani even through spring training as he came over here and made his the major waves in Major League Baseball that is is something that's going to send major shockwaves in Japan. I can only imagine what they're talking about over there. Andy, just lastly, before we go to break, um, and we can kind of tie a bow on this story, opening day is Thursday. The season's kicking off soon. How much will this factor in and kind of seep through the MLB and the early kind of goings of this season? Is it going to be front and center, do you think? It is going to be front and center because it's the best player in baseball. And, of course, he's coming off an injury, so he won't be on the mound. But that still will be in the lineup day after day after day. So you would imagine that no matter where he goes, whatever city he goes to, this is going to be front and center on a lot of the opposing team media's mind, a lot, a lot of what's going on there. And you can't shake this. Of course, it might filter out a little bit as the news cycles usually do. And having 162 games, that will likely be. But I also want to note that the access inside clubhouses is... Uh, just so, so special for Major League Baseball after COVID maybe a little bit different but the access these reporters have the trainers sure. have inside the clubhouse during batting practice before first pitch and then immediately after the game the access is unprecedented in terms of other sports Donger's going to be a little bit more guarded about that I after see. the Korea game he was not uh, asked any questions he was ushered out the media for the Dodgers PR kind of pushed people away he wasn't able to answer questions right there and you can imagine that's going to be a similar scene over the next few weeks okay. months potentially as this new cycle moves on all right uh, we'll just have to follow it uh, Andy Mack here live for us in the live now newsroom Andy thanks so much of course all right in the meantime here I want to put up this tweet uh, as we kind of um, tie a bow uh, on this story here uh, as this is somewhat of a summary actually there you see Bob Nightingale uh, who we've been relying on as well a great uh, source there on Twitter Quoting Otani, saying, I've never been on baseball or any other sports. I never asked anyone to do it on my behalf. So that seems like um, kind of the theme, the line from that press conference. Let's take a quick commercial break. Still so many more top headlines in two minutes.
And welcome back here to Live Now from Fox. I'm Andrew Kraft. Uh, it's been a busy Monday. We hope you had a good weekend. We're moving uh, quite along here with some of these top stories today, live, raw, and unfiltered. Of course, we still have our eye uh, there over the Holmby Hills mansion of Sean Diddy Combs. And you can see uh, that it looks like they have set up some type of evidence table, so to speak. Now, we have been speaking to legal analysts and national security folks, or law enforcement, rather, um, that explain to us how these raids go uh, and so you see they're still on the scene they've been on the scene now i would say more than two hours uh, we don't have our vantage point anymore uh, over the miami residence of sean diddy combs um, but we have this live picture coming to us from sky fox in, in los angeles there so you see as we have talked about evidence being gathered and collected uh into what we are told is an ongoing federal sex trafficking probe now the raid happened at a residence, two residences, of Sean Diddy Combs. Uh, you know, we cannot speculate on whether he will be wrapped up into the investigation or whether it's going to be associates of his, family members of his, friends of his. It is too early to determine that. All we know right now is these raids are occurring live as we speak. Numerous investigators uh, are now going through these many thousand square feet in this mansion here in Holmby Hills to look for evidence uh, both digital and hardware. So in the meantime, uh, we're going to keep that up, but we got a lot more top headlines left to get to. So uh, at the bottom of the hour, we're going out to Israel, we're going out to Tel Aviv, uh, we're going to be speaking with one of our friends, freelance reporter Zach Anders, about all of this news happening on the Israel-Hamas war front after what happened today at the UN Security Council. The United States abstained from a resolution uh, that would have called for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. Secretary of State Antony Blinken says this, because the final text does not have key language we view as essential, notably a condemnation of Hamas, we could not support it. That's the reasoning from Secretary of State Blinken. You're about to hear from U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Linda Thomas-Greenfield, our representative there in New York at the Security Council. Uh, they're going to be debating this. You're going to watch her raise her hand in abstention. Now, the abstention itself uh, has really incensed and infuriated Israeli Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu, so much so that he has called off canceled a high-ranking senior delegation that was going to be visiting Washington just this week. So we're going to let you watch that. We're going to keep up the shots there in Los Angeles over Diddy's home as well. It's a very busy Monday. Let's watch. Thank you, Mr. President. At the top, I want to express my deepest condolences to the families and loved ones of last week's terrorist attack in Moscow. We condemn terrorism in all its forms and stand in solidarity with the Russian people in grieving the loss of life from this horrific event. Colleagues, today this council spoke out in support of the ongoing diplomatic efforts led by the United States, Qatar, Egypt, to bring about an immediate and sustainable ceasefire, secure the immediate release of all hostages, and help alleviate the tremendous suffering of Palestinian civilians in Gaza who are in dire need of protection and life-saving humanitarian assistance. The United States fully supports these critical objectives. In fact, they were the foundation of the resolution we put forward last week, a resolution that Russia and China vetoed. But colleagues, the United States' support for these objectives is not simply rhetorical. We're working around the clock to make them real on the ground through diplomacy because we know that it is through only through diplomacy that we can push this agenda forward. We're getting closer to a deal for an immediate ceasefire with the release of all hostages, but we're not there yet. Now, let's be clear. A ceasefire could have come about months ago if Hamas had been willing to release hostages, months ago. Instead, Hamas continues to stand in the way of peace, to throw up roadblocks, cower in tunnels beneath Gaza cities and behind uh, under civilian infrastructure and hide among the civilian population. So today, my ask to members of this council and to member states in every region of the world is this. Speak out and demand unequivocally that Hamas accepts the deal on the table. Now, I hope I'm wrong. I really do. But I don't expect that from Russia and China, especially because they still can't bring themselves to condemn Hamas's terrorist attacks on October 7th. Just last week, Russia and China vetoed a resolution that condemned this horrific attack, a resolution the vast majority of this council supported. They have shown time and time again that they are not actually interested in advancing a durable peace through diplomatic efforts, nor for all their rhetoric 
are they interested in making any meaningful contributions to humanitarian efforts. Instead, they are using this devastating conflict as a political cudgel to try to divide this council at a time when we need to come together. It is deeply, deeply cynical, and we should all see through it. Colleagues, we appreciated the willingness of members of this council to take some of our edits and improve on this resolution. Still, certain key edits were ignored, including our request to add a condemnation of Hamas. And we did not agree with everything in the resolution. For that reason, we were unfortunately not able to vote yes. However, as I've said before, we fully support some of the critical objectives in this non-binding resolution. And we believe it was important for the council to speak out and make clear that our ceasefire must, any ceasefire must come with the release of all hostages. Indeed, as I've said before, the only path to a durable end to this conflict is the release of all hostages. Critically, a ceasefire and the release of hostages will allow much more humanitarian aid to get into Gaza at a time when famine is looming large and provide an opportunity to work toward a sustainable cessation of hostilities, toward a future where Hamas can no longer threaten Israel and never repeat October 7th and no longer control Gaza and use civilians as shields toward a future where Palestinians and Israelis live side by side in peace in two democratic states of their own. Something that will never happen with Hamas, a terrorist organization dedicated to the destruction of Israel and the killing of Jews, a terrorist organization this body still fails to condemn, controlling, Hamas, uh, controlling Gaza. Colleagues, we meet during the holy month of Ramadan. This should be a reason, a season of peace for Muslim communities around the world. Just as October 7th, Simhat Torah should have been a day of peace for Jewish communities. This resolution rightly acknowledges that during the month of Ramadan, we must recommit to peace. Hamas can do that by accepting the deal on the table. A ceasefire can begin immediately with the release of the first hostage. And so we must put pressure on Hamas to do just that. This is the only path to securing a ceasefire and the release of hostages as we have all called for today. That is what this resolution means. A ceasefire of any duration must come with the release of hostages. This is the only path. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I thank the representative of the United States for their statement. I give the floor to the representative of Slovenia. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Today is an important day. Most of all, we hope it will signal an important day for the people of the Middle East, a day that will help silence the guns stop the killing, free the hostages, as well as bring some calm to and clear over the sky, uh, the clear the sky over Gaza. The day that marks the beginning of the end of pain and suffering of civilians. This is a significant day for the elected members. We found our voice of an unifying force inside the council. This is the reason why we are on the council. We show the leadership for peace. And it is a good day for the whole council as we aligned our efforts and decision with the calls coming from the UN General Assembly and the UN Secretary General, from the humanitarian organizations, and from the world public. We demonstrated that we can find unity for peace, a small step in rebuilding trust in the Council. Today's resolution is just the beginning. We will need more of this unity for Gaza, as well as for many other conflicts, and Slovenia is ready. Mr. President, I don't need but I wish to thank my colleagues, the elected members, as we went through the process together. This is Slovenia's third month on the Council, and we are looking forward to many more joint ventures together in search of peace. I wanted to thank the permanent members for giving us a chance, for having trust in the power of the EU10, and for being patient during negotiations. Mr. President, we delivered the strongest signal thus far. We demand an immediate ceasefire for the month of Ramadan leading to lasting, sustainable ceasefire. It is a call we have all been desperate to hear from the Council. A short and focused resolution is a first sign from the Council that this conflict must stop. It offers an opportunity for peace for Palestinians and an opportunity for diplomatic efforts, including those of Egypt, Qatar, and the US, to continue. We express our appreciation for the commitment of the Secretary General, UN staff members on the ground, humanitarian coordinators, as well as for the leadership of different UN agencies, humanitarian and health organizations, including UNRWA. We recall the binding nature of the Security Council resolutions and call for swift implementation of this clear resolution, 
in particular with regard to the ceasefire, the unconditional release of hostages, and the urgent need for expansion of the flow of humanitarian aid. We also reiterate our call for full respect of international law, including international humanitarian law and human rights law. Thank you. I thank the representative of Slovenia for their statement. I give the floor to the representative of the Republic of Korea. Thank you, Mr. President. Today's adoption of the resolution proposed by the E10, including the Republic of Korea, has a historic meaning in that it is the very first resolution by this council that demands a ceasefire in Gaza. After numerous attempts by the council and consistent <coughs> appeals by the UN Secretary General, OCHA, and so on, amid rising cash tolls. It is also significant that this is the first ever resolution introduced by the E10 and adopted on a Security Council regional agenda item. As one, as one of the E10, the Republic of Korea is pleased by today's adoption of the resolution and commends the dedicated efforts of all E10 colleagues, including Mozambique, E10 coordinator, Algeria, representing the views of the Arab world, and Japan, the presidency of the council, in the process of drafting and negotiating the resolution. In addition, we appreciate the cooperation of the P5, in particular the US, for its sincere and utmost coordination with the E10 in the spirit of compromise. In order for today's resolution to have concrete significance beyond the internal politics of the Security Council, it must have a tangible impact on the situation in the Gaza Strip by saving the lives of innocent civilians and easing the humanitarian crisis. The situation on the ground in Gaza must be different before and after this resolution. This will only be possible when both Israel and Hamas respect and faithfully implement this resolution. Even though it is not explicitly coercive under Chapter 7 of the Charter, the parties to the conflict must bear in mind that this resolution reflects the consensus of the international community, one forged through active discussion in the Security Council and General Assembly for more than five months. The most important thing is implementing the ceasefire starting right now. As defined in the resolution, violence and firing must be ceased immediately. Hostages taken by Hamas Hamas and other groups must be returned to their families right away. Barriers to the provision of humanitarian assistance must be lifted. The entire international community must also actively cooperate to save civilian lives and overcome acute food insecurity through humanitarian aid at scale. Restore basic public order and improve Gaza's fundamental public services, including health and sanitation. All right, so you've been listening in there to ambassadors of the U.N. Security Council today, uh, including our own Linda Thomas-Greenfield, uh, talk about the Israel-Hamas war. Um, so this was the debate uh, right before the vote took place on yet another resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. The resolution passed the first time, a resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza, passing there at the U.N., the United States not rejecting it but abstaining from it, which has... Uh, sent Israeli leaders in somewhat uh, of a tizzy over this. They are not happy about this so much so they are canceling uh, a high-ranking senior delegation trip this week. Uh, and so we're going to be breaking all of this down. We're also going to be uh, getting updates on the latest when it comes to the hostage deal negotiations. This, as we have two live pictures there, one in Los Angeles, the other in Miami, as Sean Diddy Combs's homes have been raided by coastally by investigators into what we are being told is a federal sex trafficking investigation. So uh, there's a lot going on. We're at the bottom of the hour. When we come back, we'll be going out to Tel Aviv, speaking to some of our friends and reporters there about all this news happening in the Israel-Hamas war. We'll have it in two minutes.
And welcome back here to Live Now from Fox. Uh, I'm Andrew Kraft. Uh, let's get into more of these top stories, including updates and developments in the Israel-Hamas war. Live Now look there in Tel Aviv, in Israel right now, a gorgeous skyline view. Uh, well, that's where we find uh, freelance international journalist, our friend, Zach Anders. He's standing by with the latest on all of this. Um, Zach, good to see you. Uh, I know you've been covering this Thank extensively you. here. Um, I want to start with you, though, about this vote that took place at the UN Security Council in New York today. Um, this resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza, it passed. It passed with an abstention by the United States, uh, and we know Israeli officials are just incensed over this. I want to get a sense of how upset they are. Before we just do that, I want to put up this tweet here from Antonio Guterres. He is the UN Secretary General. He says the Security Council just approved a long-awaited resolution on Gaza, demanding an immediate ceasefire and the immediate and unconditional release of all hostages. This resolution must be implemented. Failure would be unforgivable. Zach Blinken says because the final text does not have a condemnation of Hamas, that is what led to the abstention today. Israeli officials um, still, though, not satisfied with that answer, right? And, and it, it, it can be looked at in several different ways as this is a momentous decision because potentially it pushes the hostage deal to the finish line over the weekend. There was some major movement there. Netanyahu had uh, given the team that was negotiating in Doha apparently, per a report in Axios, given them more room in, in this agreement. There was a, a hard line about the number of Palestinian prisoners to be released, and the Israelis conceded, and apparently were willing to release up to 700 Palestinian prisoners, including 100 of those who are serving life sentences for killing Israelis. Now they were tried in Israeli courts. But this would all be in return for the release of 40 hostages of the 132 that are remaining. There's still not proof of life for many of these hostages. So the assumption within some of the Israeli sources that I've spoken to is that there's a good number of these hostages will be repatriating their bodies, that they have already been killed, that they were either killed on October 7th or they were killed in the fighting and the conflict, the, the carnage that has been uh, enveloping Gaza now for six months. Uh, uh, what is really the reality here, uh, as the Israeli leadership, like you mentioned, is incensed, is that the U.S. stepped out of the way and allowed for this, they, they forgave, forgone their, their veto power and allowed for a proposal, a, a resolution to pass, which they, they cannot uh, uh, appreciate in any form or context um, because it does call for this ceasefire. And the Israelis still have the end of this military campaign uh, as the cornerstone of all of their planning, all of right. the direction that's given to the IDF. The, uh, uh, the public is told that this is a campaign to eliminate Hamas and will go to the very end. So, so a, a, a lasting ceasefire, is some of the language used here in this resolution, uh, is something that the Israelis cannot get behind because they will then not be able to continue this uh, military campaign. Um, but why the Israeli leadership is so upset at the very end? So, so a, a, a lasting ceasefire is some of the language used here in this resolution. Uh, it is something that the Israelis cannot get behind because they will then not be able to continue this uh, military campaign. Um, but why the Israeli leadership is so upset, again, comes back to the, the U.S. stepping out of the way. There, this is reminiscent of in 2016 during the uh, Iran nuclear deal. Uh, there was a big row between the Obama administration, the Netanyahu camp, and that was the only time that in the last decade we've seen the U.S. not veto a proposal that Israel uh, was uh, pounding down the door trying to make sure would not pass in some form or fashion. Uh, Israel's not on the Security Council. The U.S. is a permanent member of the Security Council, has covered Israel many times uh, when it comes to proposals and uh, resolutions concerning the Middle East. Um, so this, uh, in, in broad terms, this puts Netanyahu in a very difficult place, in a very difficult position, sure. uh, because he's supposed to have the U.S. support. And here's a clear signal to the Israeli public that the U.S. Uh, support has eroded, oh. that the support for Netanyahu has eroded. We saw uh, one of his main opposition uh, rivals uh, inside Israeli politics, Benny Gantz, who in a poll, a public opinion poll this month, would beat Netanyahu in a head-to-head -head election if it was held today. And uh, as a result of this uh, today at around 7 o'clock local time, uh, Benny Gantz posting, he's a part of the war government here, this temporary war government that's been formed. He's posted uh, that this uh, is uh, unacceptable for Netanyahu to with, uh, withdraw this sure. uh, delegation, that uh, Netanyahu himself should go to Washington and should wow. speak to Biden himself, and that no Israeli leaders should be pulled away and not sent to the U.S. at this time. Yeah, you know, Zach, um, we know Benny Gantz was just in Washington, um, but this kind of encapsulates uh, the anger 
from Netanyahu's part. The prime minister's Twitter account sent out the official statement saying this. The U.S. has abandoned its policy in the U.N. today. Just a few days ago, it supported a Security Council resolution that linked a call for a ceasefire to the release of hostages. I want to put this up, too, because this from Liz Frieden at the Pentagon for Fox. She quotes John Kirby today at the White House Briefings Act. Kirby said this, our vote does not, and I repeat, does not represent a shift in our policy, but because the final text does not have the language that we think is essential, like the condemnation of Hamas, we could not support it. Now, do Israeli officials, are they led to believe, or are they led to wonder, why didn't the U.S. just reject it and vote no? Why did they abstain if that was such kind of a crucial piece of language, the condemnation of Hamas? Are they scratching their heads over there over that fact? Not entirely. The Israelis see through this, and, and the Israeli leadership recognizes that this is the U.S., in a sense, saying it's time for this to end. It's time for a ceasefire. There's a huge row right now over the uh, operation that they are planning to take on in Rafah. There's about 1.5 million Palestinians that have moved into this area now, and the Rafah operation is, by and large, considered the final moment of this Israeli campaign inside Gaza to eliminate Hamas, that Hamas, they say, has moved with the civilian population, gone into these refugee areas, and that's where they're hiding. This is going to be their last stand. The U.S., and we've seen Vice President Kamala Harris, say that this would be unacceptable to move into Rafah, that there's no form of this campaign that would be acceptable to U.S. standards, uh, and that there's just no plan in place to protect the civilian life in a campaign in taking place uh, in, in such a small, condensed area. Um, it, it's for the Israelis. They they recognize now what is happening in, in Washington. That they aren't going to have the same level, the the unconditional amount of U.S. support. Even though we're seeing the statements uh, by uh, Blinken and uh, by the National Security Advisor uh, Jake Sullivan that no change in policy, that the U.S. is still supporting Israel and its goals to eliminate Hamas. It, it's still two conflicting messages coming out of D.C. right now. Okay. And, and Israel's recognizing, the Netanyahu government especially is recognizing that this is getting into a point where if they're not going to have the U.S. support uh, for the Rafah operation, then they publicly, within their own domestic base, are going to be selling this as we're going in alone. We don't have the U.S. support. Okay. And there's still no real plan for uh, the day after as well. So sure. uh, th this is just one big mess especially, but uh, it, it, it has been a, a particularly difficult day for Netanyahu, uh, especially recognizing uh, that uh, he domestically is facing now so much pressure and the opponents are coming at him from both sides. He's had uh, members of his war cabinet resign today as well. Oh, wow. um, so th this government is on shaky ground. And it's really, if they, they can't get this hostage deal across the finish line, we just saw uh, out of Doha just about an hour ago, less than an hour ago, that Hamas rejected the latest uh, proposal for this hostage outline, this hostage deal. Um, so really, Netanyahu, it appears in, in all regards, is backed into a corner and losing support. All right, um, Zach Anders, we're going to have to leave it at that there live for us.